Good afternoon, Canterbury community, and welcome to our ANZAC service. Everyone has an ANZAC story to share and reflect on, and today it is my privilege to share a story that is special to our Year 11 cohort. During our Year 11 camp to Emu Gully, we heard the remarkable story of Herbert Crowther Foxton. Herbert's story of the importance of family, mateship, and his incredible resilience is one that has stayed with me. Herbert Crowther Foxton, a 24-year-old watchmaker from Dublin, Ireland, embarked on a journey of hope and opportunity where he set sail for Toowoomba, Australia, seeking a new life. Little did he know that the world would plunge into depth of war upon his arrival. In the face of adversity, Herbert didn't hesitate. He answered the call to duty and enlisted in the army on the 19th of January 1915, assigned to the 25th Battalion, D Company. Six months later, he embarked on a perilous voyage aboard the HMAT Aeneas bound for distant shores. After a two-month waterbound journey, he arrived in Egypt. There, Herbert underwent rigorous training and unaware of the horrors that would await him. One month later, in August 1915, he found himself on the shores of Gallipoli, navigating treacherous terrain steeped in the blood of fallen comrades, who had arrived just five months prior. Having just missed the August offensive, he soon rose through the ranks to second lieutenant. Herbert had witnessed the devastating toll of war as death had claimed so many lives. As the campaign came to an end, evacuation plans were set in motion. Herbert and nearly 100,000 troops had prepared the retreat from the peninsula. Amidst chaos and despair, Charles Bean captured the haunting scenes of sacrifice and resilience that defined Herbert's journey. The cemeteries of Anzac were never without men, in twos and threes or singly, tidying up the grave of some dear friend and repairing or renewing little packing wood crosses and rough inscriptions. On the eve of Christmas, 20th of December, the final echoes of footsteps faded from the sands of Anzac Cove. For the soldiers who departed, it was a poignant moment. A mixture of relief to escape the horrors of war, yet heavy with the sorrow of leaving their fallen comrades. In the wake of the evacuation, Joseph Murray penned his emotions. I was extremely angry, as I had for a long time cherished the hope that I would leave this inhospitable graveyard, defiant and with my head held high. I could not admit, even to myself, that we had been beaten after the sacrifice of so many men. To desert our fallen comrades and sneak away in the dark without a fight is a revolting thing, and the thought of it nauseates me. By the middle of March, amidst the grim landscape of the Western Front, and being a part of the first major action of Poziers, Herbert meets a new and great friend, Cecil Arthur Octoloni. During the chaos, they forged a bond that would endure the harshest of trials. Together they faced relentless onslaught of war for two gruelling years, until fate intervened in the form of a German chemical warfare attack. Mustard gas, a silent killer, descended upon the trenches, leaving devastation in its wake, capable of blinding and potentially killing victims. Despite the peril, Herbert's quick thinking saved him from the deadly fumes, and he wrapped his head in a urine-soaked cloth, stopping the potent chlorine from entering his system, which saved him. But he was still wounded, and soon found himself in a hospital bed, grappling with wounds both seen and unseen. Undeterred by adversity, Herbert returned to the front lines a month later, rejoining his unit and good friend Cecil, to battle the relentless wrath of war once more. But fate had a different idea in mind. An enemy projectile was fired and an explosive shell burst near him and left him wounded and battered, casting him into the cycle of recovery at the hospital again. Several months had passed and Herbert was sent to return to the battalion, gaining a promotion to captain and continued to show great gallantry on the Western Front. By July 1918, the Western Front saw a shift. Both the German and Allied forces initiated offences that would ultimately shatter the German army. Herbert found himself amidst one of these assaults when a shell exploded nearby, leaving him severely wounded. Stretcher bearers rushed to his aid, but the extent of his injuries, including a gaping hole in his face, rendered him blind and unable to speak. Immediate treatment was critical. However, when medics arrived, they feared for Herbert's survival and opted to prioritise another soldier. In a heartbreaking decision, Herbert was left to die at the train station, his fate uncertain. Within a day, Herbert Foxton's body was discovered miraculously alive. Rushed to the 3rd London General Hospital, he underwent 25 surgeries to reconstruct his face, utilising pioneering techniques. Despite the experimental nature of the procedures, 
Herbert persevered through the gruelling experience. After two years of treatment, Herbert mastered braille, typing and woodworking, showcasing remarkable resilience and determination. Throughout this challenging period, Herbert found solace and strength in the unwavering support of his dear friend Ruth Love, whom he had met in Dublin during his days as a watchmaker. After facing numerous setbacks due to his complete blindness, Herbert decides to seek further assistance by returning to England for additional treatment in the hopes of restoring his eyesight. With the help of Sir Richard Cruz, King George V's personal eye surgeon, partial eyesight successfully restored to the left side of Herbert's face. Encouraged by this process, Herbert returns to Australia, eager to resume his life with renewed hope. In Toowoomba, he somehow reunites with Ruth Love, and they later get married that year. By 1942, World War II had broken out. Hello, Australian. It is my melancholy duty to inform you Australia is also at war. And after living the nightmares of World War I, Herbert felt the need to offer help in the effort to combat the Germans. He found work at a local Ford factory, building cannon carriers and jeeps to be sent out to the Pacific. Despite life's challenges, Ruth and Herbert raised four children together. But when life seemed to be making a turn for the good, Herbert's wife, Ruth, passes away, suddenly leaving Herbert and his four children alone. Coincidentally, in the same year, Herbert's eyesight failed him, rendering him completely blind, and all hopes of continuing to work fell short. Despite the darkness that threatened to consume him, Herbert found immense joy in the laughter and innocence of his 12 grandchildren. Their smiles, a beacon of hope amid life's trials. In 1984, as he reached the age of 94, Herbert's journey came to a peaceful close. In the twilight of his years, Herbert's legacy shines brightly, a testament to the indomitable human spirit. Through perseverance and courage, he turned tragedy into triumph, leaving a legacy that transcends generations. When my year 11 cohort and I heard this story, we all felt tired. We had just spent three gruelling days on camp with a lot of physical exercise, so our bodies were tired and very sore. Our camp leaders and teachers challenged us to work together and pull a truck. Many of us did not really want to do this, but after hearing Herbert's story of resilience and how he faced incredible challenges, we were going to rise to this challenge. Our cohort became a team who were there to support each other. With Herbert's challenges at the front of our minds, we dug deep, grabbed that rope and pulled that truck the length of an airfield, not once, but twice. Hearing the stories of the Anzacs provides so much perspective to young people today. I am grateful that their sacrifices allow me the freedoms I have. I am grateful to hear Herbert's reason for living, with one simple decision to keep going when faced with extremely challenging times. I am grateful that their stories and their legacies can live on. We too can create a domino effect of positivity.